I invite you to open your Bible to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, as we continue our series entitled Conversations with Jesus, I'd like you to take a look at Mark chapter 8 for tonight's conversation, which is a very brief one, uh, but an interaction nonetheless with the Lord and one of his creation. Mark chapter 8, verse 22 through 26. The word of God says, they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see men like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. And then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. May God accomplish this miracle in our hearts, even tonight in an increasing way. Eureka, it's the state motto, you know. Legislatures tried to change it to in God we trust in I think the 50s or maybe 60s, but it's California, it didn't happen. We stuck with Eureka. You know the, the significance of Eureka in our state. It has to do with that Sutter's Mill, discovery of gold, 1848 or so, 49 gold rush, all through that decade, lots of people were hoping to say Eureka, a Koine Greek word that means I found it or I see it or I discovered it. Eureka, it's also a quaint town full of hippies in Northern California. It's attributed its original usage and popularity to Archimedes. Archimedes was a mathematician and scientist and he was into floating things. I'm not a mathematician or a scientist. I went to seminary, so this will be that kind of an explanation. He made a principle, and, and in his principle came after his famous cry of Eureka. He was in his bathtub one day, uh, kind of odd, but he noticed something about volume and displacement of water that no one had ever thought about it like that before. It solved a puzzle for him in his mathematical mind that he realized you could measure the volume of an object, especially an irregularly shaped object, based on the amount of water that's displaced by it. And that's the whole of the science part you'll get from me. The part of the story that's memorable, or at least legendary, there in his bath in Syracuse, he jumps out and runs through the streets, screaming Eureka, forgetting to put on his towel, made a memory of, of the evening, and Archimedes is weird. You understand his word, though, Eureka. It's an astonishing realization. A word that's something you say when you finally figured it out, when you see something you've never seen before, when your understanding is brought to a more full measure. And hopefully, that's something that's happened to you throughout your life. Maybe you've never discovered a mathematical principle, at least originally, or a scientific theory that's named after you, but we've all learned and grown and developed in our understanding. We've all moved from various stages of immaturity to maturity in various ways. And you remember the, the first steps of maturity were celebrated in your infancy as you used a spoon for the first time and your parents would have clapped and no one claps for you when you use a spoon anymore. Uh, it was a big deal that first time. You'll look back to your, your freshman year of high school and the fact that you survived it uh, even though you were a freshman in high school, and you don't understand the things that you understand now, but you look back and you remember 
those little eurekas that were part of growing up and maturing and moments that were uh, maybe cataclysmic or maybe small, but you cried out when you realized that you learned something and you'd grown and you're changing. We all understand the idea of growing in our understanding, of developing in our knowledge of something, and more than just knowledge, the really appropriation of knowledge. And hopefully that's what's happening to all of us in varying degrees. We're developing and deepening our understanding of our particular jobs and responsibilities, of our skill in, in our homes as, as parents and spouses. Uh, perhaps you're uh, switching to a new job and you're learning new skills. Whatever it is, we all make realizations and increases in our perception of understanding things. And there's something related to that that's happening in Mark chapter 8, especially this section beginning all the way back in verse 1 where Jesus feeds the 4,000. This serves as a turning point in Mark's gospel that runs from chapter 8 to 9 to 10 to 11. It's this section of Mark that contains his purpose statement when he tells us in Mark 10, 45 that Jesus announcing his, his purpose, his thesis, that he did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. As Mark displayed Jesus' power for the first seven chapters of his brief gospel, he's shown Jesus to be a miracle worker, one who has power from a divine source. Mark has put Jesus' great ability to calm the sea and to heal diseases and cast out demons and even raise the dead, but it's not until chapter eight of the Gospel of Mark that we encounter a miracle in Mark's arrangement that has taken place in all the other Gospels many times by this point in the telling of the story. And that is the miracle of seeing being restored, of sight being given to a blind person. Jesus healed lots of blind people in his ministry, and those accounts are sprinkled throughout the Gospels. But in the Gospel of Mark, he reserves his first healing of a specific blind person and restoring their sight until chapter 8. And I think he does this for literary purposes. In this fulcrum section, in this purpose section where there's beginning to be a turn in Jesus' focus, not just on the crowds, but on leading his disciples to where they need to be in their understanding of Jesus' identity that will culminate just in a few short chapters at the, the transfiguration as Jesus unveils fully and truly who he really is and will lead his disciples to the purpose of his coming, not just through his statement about uh, coming to serve and to give his life as a ransom, but demonstrating that truth when he dies on the cross and raises from the dead. At this point in the story, this turning point in Mark's gospel, this, this middle section where Mark is not just anymore showing Jesus' power, but really showing the importance of recognizing and realizing who Jesus is. And Mark becomes most concerned with explaining this reality as the disciples struggle with their understanding being dulled and muted. It's dulled and Jesus used the healing, uh, prior uh, the healing of a deaf man in chapter seven, verse 31 to 37. You can see it there. It says, then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down into the Sea of Galilee, into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. They begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He's done all things well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Jesus is increasingly revealing himself to his disciples, fully showing his disciples furthering showing his disciples what they don't understand and what they're seeing 
and he's correcting their understanding and their perceptions of, of who he is as they've followed him with a muddled view of his mission. And though they've seen his authority as Messiah for their, nearly their entire time with Jesus in these eight chapters in Mark, they now need to come to a place of comprehending what the Messiah must do. That the identity of the Messiah, the chosen one of God, the anointed one, the one the Old Testament has been leaning towards and waiting for, and the people of God have been anticipating to redeem them and deliver them and save them, the disciples now are at a point where they must realize that Jesus is the promised one. But they need to go further than that and understand what it means that he's the Messiah. And the short answer is that they're going to have to come to comprehend the reality that the Messiah is going to suffer. And this is going to take an extraordinary miracle on God's part in opening their eyes to this truth. So in this little paragraph nestled here in the midst of this moment where the Lord is trying to press on his disciples that they need to grow in their understanding of who he is and what he's called to do, having already acknowledged his authority demonstrated by all his miracles, Mark now places this one miracle of Jesus's healing a blind person, something that Jesus would have been very famous for already in his ministry. But in Mark's telling of the story, he's reserved it for this point so the disciples' understanding and perception could be made like a parable. In the healing of the deaf man first in chapter seven, and now the blind man in chapter eight, like the other miracles that Jesus has performed throughout Galilee and all through his ministry, Mark is showing that Jesus is the one who will fulfill the call of the Messiah to bring salvation to God's people. But it also serves as an acted out or a demonstrable metaphor for the failure of the religious leaders who are truly blind to who Jesus is. That's why in chapter eight, verse 14, look at it with me, it says, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread. This is uh, on the, right, on the tail of the feeding of the 4,000. And this is another incident. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Are you still not see? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. And he said to them, do you still not understand? For Mark's telling of this story, he's trying to impress on the disciples and impress on his readers in this enacted parable who Jesus really is. They've been warned and rebuked to watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. And so this miracle in verse 22 through 26 comes right on the back of that rebuke from Jesus. The representatives of Israel had failed to see and hear that the kingdom of God was dawning onto the scene in Jesus. And so Jesus restores this man's sight in a peculiar and unusual two-step healing miracle, unlike anything Jesus ever does, and shows in doing it in this particular and unusual way that the disciples need a similar experience on a spiritual level so that their eureka moment of realizing who Jesus is and why he has come, which is going to be revealed in the next paragraph, verse 27, in Peter's confession of Christ at Caesarea Philippi, you are the Christ, is a dawning moment of seeing who Jesus is, a eureka moment of realizing something they had not fully understood before, but will begin a journey of a deepened understanding that will look like this gradual climbing out of darkness and into light will be filled with this discipleship journey that 
starts and stops and starts and stumbles and progresses and and makes a step back, but has this dawning realization from the mouth of Peter of the true identity of Jesus revealed by God himself. The disciples' faith doesn't look like eureka and then climb and climb and grow and grow. Instead, it looks, well, like what our faith looks like. And it stumbles and it starts and it, it dips and it weaves and it shakes, but Step after step, it continues to gain an understanding by faith of who Jesus is and what he wants to do with us. And this enacted miracle, this encounter and conversation, this parable-like healing that Jesus accomplishes with this man from Bethsaida, we have an opportunity to learn something about our own spiritual understanding about growing in knowledge, about the doctrine of illumination. So if you're with us tonight and you're not a Christian yet, if you're still kind of considering who God is and what the claims of Jesus are, what you're seeing before you in this paragraph is exactly what God can do to you. He can bring you to a point beyond the intellectual struggles that maybe you have with Christianity beyond the difficulties you have with the claims of Jesus or the demands of Jesus on his disciples, something can happen to you by an act of God, by the touch of Jesus that can transform you from someone who did not see Jesus as the son of God and savior of the world to someone who not only sees it to be true, but adores him and longs to know him more and insists on following him all the days of your life. And friend, if you're a new believer, you've only been a Christian for a little while, and that describes so many of you who God has recently brought to our church. If you're relatively new to the Christian faith, just learning those first steps of discipleship, this conversation that Jesus has with the blind man from Bethsaida serves as an encouragement to you that though your steps may not be very true right now, And though you stumble at times, it's Jesus' work to increasingly clarify and grow your understanding, just like he was doing in the lives and hearts and minds of his disciples. And if you've been a Christian for a long time, I think you'll leave a passage like this just more grateful for the grace of God that brought you to where you are, that reminded you that apart from God's intervention and apart from Jesus' touch, you would not see what you see so clearly now. You wouldn't know what you know so sweetly now. And so let's look at this beautiful arrangement of this first healing of a blind person in Mark's account and learn what it means to grow in our spiritual understanding, what it means for God to illuminate spiritual truth to sinful and blind people. And I think the best way to do this is to raise above the narrative here. It's a simple narrative. It looks nearly just like every other healing in Jesus' ministry with a few interesting exceptions. It follows a really typical pattern except for the unusual element that's inserted. In most of these parables, they have Jesus being approached by concerned people or a person who needs his help. Then there's usually a request element and then there's a a healing usually with a pronouncement by Jesus, and this is especially true in Mark's accounts, a reminder that they should not go and tell this all over the place because Jesus had a particular purpose and plan in how and when he was revealing himself and who his messengers would be and what they were announcing. And then that's kind of how the miracles go. This particular miracle of the healing of the blind man from Bethsaida looks a lot like that, except it looks more identical almost exactly identical to the healing that occurred in chapter seven, verses 31 to 37, that I read to you a moment ago, the healing of the deaf and mute man. I want you to, for a moment, before I give you kind of our theological outline to walk through this thing, I want you to consider, because I'm building a case here for Mark making a literary decision, it's, it's widely and obviously acknowledged that, that Mark is less concerned about the chronology of the events of the gospel He's not that kind of a historian, uh, but he is more concerned about the message of Christ and the significance and meaning of it. It's not less true, it's just the way he's arranging it with with artistry and with his 
is bent towards this authorship. Uh, the other writers, especially Matthew and Luke, uh, have more attention to this event and then that event. Mark instead is crafting a literary masterpiece with a, a very intentional pace and flow and focus in order to see the, the shadow of the cross cast on every paragraph as his readers move through the drama as he presents it with such theological care. Mark, in that way, is much more like John, the evangelist in his gospel, leading us with purpose and intention. And so I realize I have to make that case to you, and so let me do so by first showing you that this account of the healing of the deaf and mute man in chapter seven, verses 31 through 37, is intentionally presented in an identical fashion as the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida of chapter eight, verse 22 through 26. So we're building a bit of a chart in our minds, if you will. So these two healings, the one we're looking at tonight and the one in chapter seven, have some really striking similarities. Both are instigated by people. It says that unnamed people bring this person who has a great need to Jesus. Both of these miraculous enacted parables involve the word parakaleo, which is a word for to, a Greek word for to beseech or call upon, to persuade or to, to beg Jesus. In chapter seven, it's in verse 32. They begged him to place his hand on the man. In our passage, it's in chapter 22. They came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus or beseeched Jesus. They asked of him. They had like a relentless kind of request. The word means to beseech, to call upon, to persuade, or to beg. And so the unnamed people in both passages, according to Mark's account, beseech Jesus, they request, they beg, they strongly ask, they repeatedly seek his favor and his healing in both passages. He brings the object of his compassion to a private audience, Pulling them away from the crowd in the Bethsaida passage, he brings the man completely outside of the town limits so he can have a private audience with them. In both passages, he lays his hands on the people, physically touching the area that is afflicted on the person in both of these passages. And this is one of the unique features of this particular healing, but that is paralleled in both. He employs his own saliva in their healing. More on that in a moment. It's these two passages and one other in the Gospels where he turns mud into paste with saliva that Jesus employs his spit into the healing process. Now, if you have questions about that, I did a whole sermon on spit to the college students because it just seemed appropriate. Uh, in Mark chapter seven, verse 31, you can listen to that and I'll save, I'll save your sensibilities. But let me just give you a, a quick 20 minute excursus on spit in the ancient world. No, I'm kidding, I'm not gonna do that tonight. Instead, understand this, when we think of spit, we think of saliva, we think of hygiene or the lack thereof, we think of halitosis, we think of glands and anatomy, if you can pronounce the word anatomy. That, that's what we think of. In the ancient world, spit wasn't seen that way. Instead, it, it had great symbolism to it. The ancients thought about it quite differently in the way that it, it represented a person, especially a leader. There was oftentimes associated medicinal qualities with spit of all things. And that's just part of the huge cultural gap between us and, and 2,000 years ago. But I think if you focus too much on the spit here, you're missing the point of the artistry and, and craft that's taking place. So just leave it there, and if you're, if you're into spit like I was, you can listen to that other sermon. So the sixth significant parallel that I see in these two passages with these two healings in chapter seven of the mutant deaf and of the blind man from Bethsaida, after the unnamed group and the beseeching and the private audience and the touch of the Lord with his saliva, the sixth one is this injunction to silence. And so here you have these perfectly parallel passages that are framing this whole account and trying to show us something about our spiritual understanding. So rather than just look at the details of this passage for an outline, 
I'd like to give you the realities that I think are being represented theologically here and prove that to you from the context of this passage. So I have three, theolo- three, three easy for me to say, three theological realities. Three theological realities. Let me give them to you as we go, one by one. Number one, the first truth I want you to understand in this passage, and I think that Mark is pressing on us here, is that sin is blinding. Sin is blinding. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, first look at verse 22. They came to Bethsaida. Now, Jesus says, you remember, he's in the northern part, the Galilee regions. He's getting out of the Decapolis area, which was featured in chapter seven. That's an area that's more Syrophoenician, pagan. We talked about it when we talked about the incident with the demoniac from Gennesaret. That was a a highly pagan area, the 10 Greco-Roman cities. He's now getting closer to the Sea of Galilee region. This is the place where he likes to cross over, where he often is found calming a storm. This is the place where several of his disciples were called from. This is a place along with Caesarea, and I didn't mean to say Caesarea, Uh, This is a place along with Chorazin, with Bethsaida. These are the hometown of the disciples. This is the the kind of area up at the north of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus did so much of his ministry. And that's where this is taking place. And as he moves into Bethsaida, he's getting pretty close to these towns and Uh, There's some debate about where Bethsaida is now, but they kind of have two lumps of dirt. Could be one of these two. They're both fishing villages. They're both good candidates for where the disciples were from. If you're into archaeology, I don't have a sermon on that, but I'm sure somebody does. But it's a familiar place to the readers of the gospel because Jesus has performed so many miracles in Bethsaida. In the other synoptics in Matthew 11 that he pronounces, and in Luke chapter 10, He pronounces a woe, a curse on Bethsaida and Chorazin. He curses the towns. Capernaum, that's the other town I was trying to say earlier. He tells them that if the miracles that were produced in those towns were done in Tyre or Sidon, those totally pagan cities would have repented. But Bethsaida does not. Similarly, in another place, Jesus says that if if Sodom and Gomorrah saw the miracles, that these towns saw, they would have repented. And so Jesus promises that he will not do another miracle in Bethsaida because of the hardness of their hearts. This is likely one of the reasons Jesus has this man leave town with him so that he could keep his promise in his oath not to perform any more miracles in this hard-hearted town as an act of judgment. And even there, we begin to see this reality that the Bible insists upon and that Mark has been leading his readers towards that sin causes blindness. Sin causes a a hardness of heart, spiritually speaking. Now, physical blindness, Jesus had to teach his disciples, is not directly caused by a person's sin or the sin of their parents. The Jews ordinarily believed that if someone was born with any kind of physical malady or deformity or difficulty, they said the parents must have sinned. This is the kind of theology they got from the book of Job, but from the bad guys in the book of Job. This is cleared up in John 9 when Jesus says it was neither this man or his parents, but it was so that God would be glorified. That kind of theology is really cruel, and Jesus debunked that with his disciples in tying every suffering to a higher purpose of glorifying God. That's a different passage, but the idea behind sin and blindness being associated with each other isn't the physical blindness being emphasized, but the spiritual blindness, this inability to perceive, an unwillingness to see things as God says they really are. And that's why Jesus has indicted the Pharisees in the previous passage. Remember, after feeding the 4,000 and performing that miracle, Jesus has his disciples pick up all the leftovers. 
He'd already had them do this when he fed 5,000 people. And right after that miracle, the Pharisees come to test him and he grieves at their hardness of heart and says, why does this generation, this is chapter eight, verse 12, why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, Jesus says, no sign will be given to it. And he left and crossed to the other side. You see, the Pharisees thought since they were in charge of the religious condition of Israel, they should be in charge of Jesus too. And so they said, do this, perform this miracle, show us something. And Jesus forbid it and said, I will not show you another sign. His disciples saw that and heard that interaction. And he, so he tells them and instructs them. You could see a sign, verse 15, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. So their request for a sign in verse 11 that Jesus denies them is followed by Jesus' warning in verse 15 of, of chapter eight, saying, be careful, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Jesus is telling his disciples to open their eyes to the danger of these false teachers to look out for their influence, their living presence, where on one side, the Herod side, look out for, for Herod's influence, they would fall into Herod-like sins, which is licentiousness and worldliness and, and sin. But they also need to look out for the Pharisee side, where they fall into externalism and legalism and, and, and man-centeredness and a God-absent, graceless religion. Both Herod and the Pharisees are the Pharisees, ironically, and Herod, obviously, absent from God. And Jesus warns his disciples that these two sides, that they need to have their eyes open to that danger. Because Jesus sees his disciples as he presents to them this, this warning and this rebuke about the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod, that his disciples are missing the point big time. In the previous story, verse 16, they discuss this with one another and and because we have no bread, Jesus is aware of their discussion, and he says to them, what are you talking about bread for? They're missing the point. Look at verse 17. Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And then he reminds them simply of how many baskets they picked up, and rather than getting into some weird numerological thing because there was a, a big earthquake this week and people get all jumpy and strange about that kind of stuff. And so then they start reading their Bible and they're like, what does the number seven mean? What does the number 10 mean? Let me get into this stuff. It must mean page 10 of the New York Times. Check it out. I got a blog. No, simply he's reminding them that they remember the, the mere and bare facts of the baskets they picked up but they're missing the point of what Jesus was doing there in revealing himself and his mission. And so this blindness that the disciples are experiencing is a spiritual kind of blindness because their eyes work perfectly well. They could see perfectly fine. They weren't physically blind, but they were spiritually dull in their understanding and they had that in common with the Pharisees. And though they understood more about Jesus than the Pharisees did, they still were at a point where they deserved the rebuke of Jesus that they didn't have eyes to see and failed to have ears to hear. And they did not remember, Jesus says in verse 21. And you can sense Jesus' exasperation when he says, do you still not understand? You see, sin is blinding to our understanding. Ephesians 4, 17 says, unbelievers walk in the futility of their mind darkened in their understanding and excluded from the life of God. We tend to think about sin just as the bad stuff we do, right? But sin is deeper than just the fruit of sin, the actions that come from being a sinner. I mean, all of us, because of our first parents, Adam and Eve, are sinners by nature, but we sin ultimately because we want to sin. And that reality shows us that sin is something that affects our minds, our desires. It's something that's inside of us. And the fact that sin blinds us and blunts our understanding and makes us stupid to the things of God shows us how pervasive our sin can be. You like memes? 
Shame on you. So do I. One of my favorite memes has been for years this picture of this handsome little black kid named Terrian Milton. He's a kid who got famous in an interview because he swiped his grandmother's SUV keys for her Dodge Durango. I think it happened in Florida. It sounds like something that would happen in Florida. And he goes with his buddy, another seven-year-old, and they go on a little joyride and crash into a bunch of cars in the Walmart parking lot, and the cops somehow get the car stopped. They pull the kid out, and there's this famous meme of this kid. It's really, it's really something. The grandma is great in it. She says, if the cameras weren't here, I'd whoop his behind. It's a good grandma. And they, they interview, the news people interview this little kid and say, why did you do this little guy? It was really dangerous. Somebody could have got hurt. And his answer, this is the famous meme, meme. I like to do hood rat stuff with my friends. You get that, right? The interview with the kid goes on and the interview says, but aren't you thinking about how this was bad for grandma and it wrecked her car and caused a lot of problems and people could have, could have got hurt and they try to reason with this kid. And his quote is, in this interview, I want to do it because it's fun. It's fun to do bad things. I mean, this is like Augustine of old. This kid is an excellent theologian. You know, there's professional theologians that don't understand human anthropology like this kid does. I think he knows more about corruption and the depraved human nature than, than some of the pros do. You see, sin doesn't just make us do hood rat stuff, bad stuff. It gets on us in a deeper level than that. It affects our loves and our desires, our wants, and even from infancy, we are so broken by sin. Augustine, the most famous biographer of the Christian life, wrote in his confessions an account from his childhood that's well known, that of stealing pears. And the thing that made it such a grievous sin in Augustine's retelling is the fact that he didn't even like the taste of pears. He just stole them because he liked to do hood rat stuff with his friends. He chucked those pears in the street. He dumped a bunch of them out to the pigs. He stole because he wanted to steal. You see, sin has blinded us and it's corrupted us and it's changed us. And it's dulled our understanding so much so that you could not see things as God wants you to see them apart from divine intervention. Do you get that? I mean, that's incredible. Here's Augustine. We carried off a huge load of pears, not to eat ourselves, but to dump out to the hogs after barely tasting some of them ourselves. Doing this pleased us all the more because it was forbidden. Such was my heart, O God, such was my heart, which thou didst pity even in that bottomless pit. Behold, now let my heart confess to thee what was seeking there when I was being gratuitously wanton, having no inducement to evil, but the evil itself. Later, Augustine says, it was foul and I loved it. I loved my own undoing, I loved my error. Not that for which I erred, but for the error itself. A depraved soul falling away from security in thee to destruction in itself, seeking nothing from the shameful deed, but shame itself. That's 1 Corinthians 2.14, isn't it? The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually, con spiritually discerned. Do you get that? Well, if you're a Christian, you do because there was a time in your life when you were not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, where God had not changed your desires, where your spiritual senses were dulled and twisted and broken, and that's why sin is so blinding. And so this man's condition becomes a metaphor for the spiritual reality that the disciples are struggling with and that the Pharisees have embodied and hardened themselves in. They don't have eyes that are able to see and ears that are able to hear, and they still do not understand. And so Jesus, who's op also operating on the very basic level of God in compassion, miraculously healing a man and restoring his sight, this isn't just a metaphor. This isn't less true because he's using it to teach his disciples. There's an actual blind man who needs help. And so Jesus tenderly puts his 
hand on the man's hand. Verse 23, he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. He'd been led like this his whole life, likely. And some surmise that maybe he was blind from an accident because of what he says about trees, but even a person blind from birth knows that a tree is a big vertical thing, so I don't know if that proves it, but the man in that world, there's no social services in ancient Rome. He'd be completely subservient to the kindness of others. Most blind people in the ancient world were beggars. Someone would have to lead them from wherever they stayed at night to a place by the market so they could just put out their hand and hope that someone would give them some bread or some figs or a little bit of money, a coin. And that's how they survived, completely dependent on the kindness of their family or other people to care for them. That would have been the horrible experience of this blind man, being led by the hand his entire life. And then Jesus, compassionate, beautiful, powerful, amazing Jesus, holds this man by the hand and leads him out of Bethsaida. Jesus then applies spit to the man's eyes and puts his hand on him, fulfilling the request, beseeching him to lay his hands on him. There's a lot of history in the Old Testament about the laying on of hands being a symbolic way of showing the connection to the person and the blessing of God and the laying on of hands. And so Jesus puts his hands on the man's eyes, on the man after putting spit on the man's eyes, and Jesus asks a searching question that is honestly pretty odd. Do you see anything? I mean, that's the kind of question I would ask if I was trying to heal you, right? Like, well, did that work? Jesus doesn't ask that kind of a question normally because Jesus knows everything. Because when Jesus heals, in all his other cases, it's instantaneous. Save for this one. This process is unusual. I wear with the Spanish called anteojos, and I have a condition, a horrible condition called nearsightedness. It's the opposite of what it sounds like. And I wear these things, and every year I go to the optometrist, and they have such antiquated machinery, honestly. The thing is huge. You'd think there'd be improvements. Maybe it's just my guy, but you put your chin in the thing, and then you look through the, the little lenses. And, and then they just like manually click a bunch of deals on the right and the left. Have you done this before? And, and I always think like, this is how they do it? They don't like map my cornea or something? It's just so old school. You look at a little hot air balloon right in the distance from New Mexico. So that, 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 that means something to me, hot air balloons. And, and they go, which one's better, this one or this one? This one or this one? And I get the sweats, honestly, because I can't really decide. It's a lot of pressure. And, and so they dial it in so tight, and, and this eye and this eye, this one or this one, this one or this one, one, two, one, two, whatever. And they dial it in, and they, they, you're trying to decide, is the hot air balloon clearer than the next one? It's a lot of pressure, honestly. They dial it in, and I think, no, that's too scary. Back it off, back it off. I, I don't want to see anything that well. Every couple years I go back, they, they tweak it around a little bit. And Jesus asks an optometrist kind of question here, doesn't he? How's that? Can you see it? Why does the omniscient Jesus ask that question? Well, he asks it because he's doing something beyond just healing this man. He's asking so the disciples go, huh? I mean, they've seen Jesus heal lots of blind people in his ministry. Mark chooses to put this particular instance at the first one he tells because of what's going on with Jesus' ministry to his disciples in the prior paragraphs. The disciples have to be asking, why is Jesus asking that question? 
And it's because Jesus is intentionally performing a two-stage miracle to expose that there is a condition that this man has that everybody knew about he couldn't see. He lived in complete darkness, and it paralleled the condition that the disciples had experienced and that the Pharisees had embodied. Can you see anything? That's usually where the pronouncement of healing goes. Go and sin no more. Raise, uh, take up your bed and walk. Go show yourself to the synagogue. Don't tell anyone, not a question. And the reason it's a question is because he's paralleling verse 17. This question there to the disciples, what are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember or do you still not see? Because sin blinds us. It's not just the bad stuff we do. It clouds our vision. It blocks us from knowing what is true and right. I mean, the reason unbelievers adopt the entirely complicated and to us seemingly illogical and stupid worldviews that they hold to this day is because the God of this world, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel to the glory of Christ. That's why it's not that helpful when we think of them merely as stupid, spiritually stupid. There ought to be some compassion on blind sinners because it's a significant thing for a blind man to see. And it's just as significant, if not of greater significance, for God to put a miracle in place in your spiritual sight that takes you from complete blindness and darkness to a clarified vision to know that the God of this world, Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving and this effects of sin being blinding that they may not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, because if your eyes were open, truly open to the way this world really is, to the glory of God, to the wickedness of sin, to the lostness of your soul, to the reality of eternal judgment, that apart from Jesus' intervening touch, if your eyes were truly open, you would see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ. But if an unbeliever's eyes are still covered with scales and sewn shut spiritually, when they're blocked from seeing what they so desperately need to see, which is the light of the gospel that leads you to see the glory of Christ, that's why Jesus is so often associated with light. So often in the Bible, this is the judgment, John 3, 19, light has come into the world, but people love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. It's not just that they are in darkness and cannot see, it's that they love darkness. You see, it's not mainly an intellectual problem that keeps a person from coming to Christ. It's not that they need more data, mainly it's a moral problem. It's that we like to do bad stuff we love darkness rather than light because our deeds are evil and that needs to be exposed. And it's why Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are the blind leading the blind. What an indictment, right? They had no spiritual perception claiming to be spiritual leaders to people who had no spiritual insight. The blind leading the blind is sin upon sin. And this man's condition illustrates the spiritual deafness and blindness both of the religious leaders and the danger that the disciples are in of having the same exact sickness. And so he shows them by way of example of this man, they need to have their eyes open to see who he really is. And sin is what's preventing it. Second theological statement briefly, salvation is seeing. Salvation is seeing. If sin is blinding, salvation is seeing. And this man is rescued from his condition in two stages. Verse 24, he looks up and says, I see people. They look like trees walking around. One of my favorite lines in all the Bible, the Greek is all busted up here. Uh, the, the version you see in your Bible is cleaned up in English. He says, I see people. They look like trees walking around in Greek. Uh, I see people I see are walking as trees. It's put real staccato. And I think that's probably exactly how the guy said it so overwhelmed by light rushing into his eyes for the first time ever or the first time in a long time, he stutter steps through this experience and he just says, I see people I see walking as trees. It's awesome. And I bet he was content with that. I don't think he was complaining. 
I think that was an incredible moment of furthering and opening and healing, and he loved what he saw. I think he would have been really happy to see people like trees for the rest of his life. This was a miracle he could see and he couldn't see before. But Jesus does it this way because salvation is seeing. And now the man is seeing, he says, I see with two different words. I see people and I see walking as trees, but there's some lingering blindness there, isn't there? Because people don't look like trees except the people that do look like trees. But if you get up close, we're just tall. And so he doesn't know what he's seeing and he doesn't understand. And it's just where the disciples are at right here. The Pharisees are still totally blind. The disciples are seeing everything like trees. It's blurry to them and they're going to continue to be very blurry. And the difference between the disciples and the Pharisees is 1 Corinthians 2.14. The man without the spirit does not accept the things that are spiritual. You see there in the process, like this blind man of, of moving from blindness to sight. And so Jesus, after the man looks up and says that Jesus puts his hands again on the man's eyes and then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly, everything clearly. In verse 23 through 25, there's eight different Greek words for nine different instances of seeing. I can't think of very many English words of seeing. Seeing and seeing, looking, opening eyes, eight different words in Greek. This moment of healing is a moment of salvation. And Jesus has opened this man's eyes completely as he sees everything clearly. And then Jesus says, go home, but don't go through the village. Bethsaida doesn't get the privilege of the testimony. They're not privileged to it because they've already rejected Jesus. A final theological concept to share with you. And it's this growing is clarifying. Growing is clarifying. What you see in the disciples is the progress of faith. What you see starts and stumbles and they will not see it clearly even at Caesarea Philippi. We'll see Jesus' identity on clear display in the words of Peter in chapter eight, verse 29, right? Who do men say that I am? Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others one of the prophets. Verse 29, what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. He starts to see everything clearly. But one minute later, he's going to say, you will not be killed, Lord, verse 32. And Jesus is gonna look at Peter in verse 33 and say, get behind me, Satan. Somebody needs to wipe their spiritual glasses off, right? You don't have the things of God in your mind, but the things of men. Just because God opened your eyes to Jesus to behold his glory doesn't mean that he's done with your understanding. We all have a lot of growing to do and it's a growing that involves the illumination that came. The theological word is illumination. The work that the spirit does in opening your eyes is to behold spiritual things. That's not just something that happened the day you were saved. It's something that began before you were a Christian. And God started to bring conviction to your heart and bring people into your life that made you recognize your sin and first told you about Jesus even when you were actively rejecting him. There was this gradual process and salvation isn't a gradual process, but the experience on our side is because there's a moment when you're saved, when you're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, but you don't see the increased understanding that you've received leading up to the day of your conversion, your new birth. You don't see how much more growing you need to do for Peter it wouldn't come right away. They spend a few more chapters rebuking Jesus along with the other disciples when he talks about his death. But when the cross comes and the tomb is empty, like the man, they'll say, we see everything clearly now. And Peter will stand up in front of a hostile crowd, scared mouse Peter, who ran away. But he'll preach with boldness in the book of Acts like a lion. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, that Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and in Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Look at Peter. A clarified spiritual vision because growing is clarifying. How does it happen? Well, whether you need this initial understanding to open your eyes tonight or whether you've had your eyes opened or whether you're still seeing things foggy, 
You understand that in this miracle, this physical miracle, in this parable enacted, the only thing that can explain it, the sole means of the healing of the increased understanding is this. It is the repeated touch of Jesus. The disciples were not understanding and then they misunderstood, but by the end of it, they'll see everything clearly. Mark 15, verse 39, the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus had this happen to him when he said, surely this man was the son of God. You see, it takes the cross and an empty tomb to see everything clearly. This is not simply a transformation and restoration of one helpless, sad, blind man. This is a description and an illustration of the miracle that happens every single time that eyes are open spiritually to behold the glory and the mission of Jesus. This is the parable of perception, a metaphor of mercy on display. When God causes us to see what before we could not see and were blind to, and then sometimes gradually and by stages opens our eyes until we can see in part, and then more fully as we grow and perceive and understand and adore all that is there for us in Jesus, Jesus, and increasingly so, all the way to glory. And it's why a glimpse of heaven like we had this morning is further described in Revelation 21 as an eternal city where they don't need to have sunlight for the glory of God gives it light and the lamb is its lamp. That's what will grow us and guide us to a full understanding of the glory of Christ for all eternity. For some of you, it needs to start today. Come to Jesus by faith, trust him and see that everything he said is true and for your good and to change you and to make you right with God and to give you the forgiveness of sins that you can only find at the cross and the victory that will come through an empty tomb. Father, thank you for your word and the miracle that's taken place in and through the Spirit's work of illumination. A lifelong ministry to the believer starting before we're converted, growing and grasping truth about Jesus being exposed to truth and then apprehending and loving that truth. Father, would your spirit convict unbelievers among us like you promised it would and bring lost sinners to being right with you. Open their eyes that they might behold the glory of the word made flesh. Father, may judgment be so clear and conviction so clear in seeing our sin as repulsive and seeing Christ as glorious. Grow us in our understanding of the glory of Jesus May we be repulsed by sin's pleasures and give all glory and honor and credit to your spirit that works in our hearts that we might know the truth. In Jesus' name, amen.